And welcome back, boys and girls, for yet again another special edition of the Michael Deacon program. Joining me in a moment is Mr. John Kelly. John is an international clinician and world-famous speech analysis to release key intelligence pertaining to the Iraq War two years in advance of the shock and awe strikes against Baghdad in 2003. Now, without further ado, let's bring in Mr. John Kelly. And joining me right now is Mr. John Kelly. How's it going, my friend? Oh, it's been a pretty exciting day, I must say. Nice. Very nice. I'm glad everything is uh, nice out there. It's uh, nice and sunny out here in Southern California. I'm enjoying the weather. And uh, yeah, lots going on, my friend. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're alive and in good spirits. Uh, <laughs> what is going on out there? I'm, I'm curious, what is the word on the streets out there? Well, I, I tuned in fortuitously just as the uh, the eclipse uh, hit full darkness uh, in yeah. Texas. I, right. I was able to pick up on some of the live feeds in our late morning here on the West Coast. And it was very sensational to say the least. I know that was uh, a, there were live events throughout the corridor where, where the eclipse was expected, uh, you know, the, the full full darkness. And um, one of the things that, that I had uh, occurred to me this uh, on this eclipse season was the possibility that folks might see some UFOs under the total darkness. And so I've been scouring YouTube, trying to find the reports of anyone who saw, it looks like there's a few candidate UFOs that were in, in some of the videos. So oh, I, really? I find that very interesting. That yes. is really interesting. I was hoping somebody would catch something. And all, well, to be honest with you, all I know is that these sort of solar events drive people insane. Well, people certainly do get excited, it's true. But my, my reference is, you know, there's a historic precedent in uh, Mexico City, 1991, and uh, around Mexico during the eclipse at that time, uh, there were dozens and dozens of cameras recording UFO phenomena. It was a, it was a uh, huge wave of you know, camcorder uh, UFOs that people hadn't seen before. So I, I thought that, you know, we, as people interested in, in the UFO subject, this, this was a, a special day when, the, you know, the veils may have parted for some of the folks. I love that. Very nice, yes. And for those who don't know, John has been on this program multiple times, and we usually talk about all sorts of awesome things, but this time, John has come with presents. He's brought all sorts of audio clips for us here, and we'll be doing the whole reverse speech thing. This is the classic John Kelly presentation with breaking news and recent events and uh, secret insights and cryptic insights that we'll be exploring together on today's show. Absolutely. I, I look forward to that. And uh, John, just for the newer listeners out there, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself very briefly? 
I'm uh, an analyst, a researcher, a, a, a journalist, and a consultant. Uh, my my uh, claim to fame is that I find secret messages that are like sleep talking messages in in the reflections of human speech using a, a digital audio workstation, uh, reversing the arrow of time. You know, uh, speech can be understood forwards and backwards. And Dr. Kurt Saberi uh, at UC Irvine in a report that was uh, letters in the letters section of Nature in one of the uh, editions from 1999. He, uh, he showed it through science that the human brain understands backward speech. And uh, he said in a follow-up interview with the school paper that uh, speech can be understood, uh, information can be gathered from speech in many different ways, including uh, backward speech. And so the, it's, this is a very interesting topic. There's not a lot more academic research around this, but there's certainly a lot of people who have been interested in the subject over decades. And I'm, I'm someone who became very prominent as a practitioner. Um, I revealed secrets about the uh, the Bush, uh, the W. Bush White House and the war in Iraq, uh, based on the George W. Bush inaugural speech. I identified the names of Russian spies in the uh, one of the famous FBI cases from the early part of uh, the last decade. Uh, I uh, have all kinds of interesting sort of uh, forecasting information, including one of the stories we'll talk about tonight, where the the subject of my analysis. Without any, you know, direct intervention on my part, uh, he he basically um, said aloud what I had claimed to have heard in his backward speech. He said it after the fact. So we'll get into that story tonight. Um, my my findings in in this area, although it sounds very uh, abstract or far fetched, are, are extremely concrete. And as a result of that, um, my work has come to the attention of uh, leading psychiatrists. Uh, uh, intelligence agencies, military agencies in the United States and throughout different parts of the world. Um, as a columnist for uh, News Inside Out, my uh, articles were being read by the Russian Foreign Ministry and the United States uh, State Department. So I, my, the ideas and the information that I'm sharing are of great interest, although the methods may seem unusual to some. Uh, with a little patient listening to, uh, on today's show, I'm sure uh, most of you will be able to follow along. Absolutely. And of course, you have a background uh, over at CBS as a radio producer. I love bringing this up. Yeah. So I, I through my uh, multi-year tour of, of the talk radio circuit, I was I came to the attention of people, uh, CBS in Minneapolis at one of the smaller sister talk stations. They, they offered me uh, an opportunity to start producing a feature there. And, uh, you know, at that time, uh, we, the feature was rolling out, but I had I had uh, other, other you know challenges. I was able to get bring my uh, my material so far, but I didn't really have uh, enough of a studio to, to produce effectively at that time. So it was a short lived feature. But I did. Uh, you know, my, my ratings were so high and the interest level, the public interest level in my appearances and the information that I was sharing uh, uh, during my regular appearances in Minneapolis. Uh, local uh, radio was persuaded that they need to bring me in. And so, yeah, I have this CBS brand uh, through radio as well as through television. I was uh, brought in to CBS uh, 11 p.m. news in Cleveland, uh, I believe it was in 2005 or 2006, uh, for the uh, rating sweeps, the Nielsen uh, Sweeps Week. So my appearance on the 11 p.m. news in Cleveland, Ohio, discussing the uh, local politicians and sports figures as well as my, some of my historic research into U.S. presidents and, and uh, uh, famous murder cases, uh, it gained uh, a two-point lead on the Nielsen rating system over the other stations. So uh, the level of interest in my content uh, demonstrated not only on talk radio, but on uh, on uh, terrestrial television uh, of that time. And most recently, uh, I, I made deals uh, for content with shows that are currently streaming on Netflix. Really? Yeah, these shows that wow. uh, a couple of um, science fiction documentary type shows uh, nice. that wanted access to some of my interview material. And again, it was from um, material that I had published to YouTube. And it, uh, just, I guess, with the passage of time, you know, I, again, I found myself uh, in the spotlight. One of the uh, one of the production companies for one of these uh, documentary series is um, Amblin Entertainment. So CBS, Amblin Entertainment, you know, I'm able to... Uh, get the attention of some of the major the major figures in, in broadcast and entertainment. Nice. I'm glad everything is uh, working out there. And uh, yes, if anyone's out there listening, go ahead and uh, put that in there and look for uh, this 
what was it, a documentary, you said, right? Uh, yeah, that documentary series, uh, that's Encounters. Is, Encounters, uh, is the, okay. Encounters on Netflix. Uh, the uh, Texas story about the uh, the southern, uh, bu the Bush White House in Texas and the UFO incident from the first uh, decade of this millennium, uh, the Stephenville UFO incident. I was on the ground uh, in, the, in the region in 2010 by other circumstances. I was on my own uh, UFO road trip where I had, was very successful actually in recording some amazing footage. Nice, uh, okay. Uh, which took me to Marfa and other places. But I was, um, I was staying down the street from uh, Dublin, Texas, which was one of the, uh, the story epicenters for the Stephenville Lights. And so I took it upon myself to do some studies of the, uh, the, one of the witnesses and uh, produce some findings, which I then uh, was ready to, prepared to start writing a story for my column on examiner.com. I was, I was the UFO examiner for Vancouver's at that time. So uh, I reached out to the witness by telephone and to the, uh, the lead journalist on that story, um, a Angela Joyner. And uh, I was able to get myself into a meeting with both of them uh, the same day in Dublin. And uh, the outcome of that meeting was that I was invited onto the property of the witness to, to, to tape overnight at one of the Stephenville uh, locations that was, you know, widely covered in all of the documentaries and, and news stories. So I got, I got privileged access to the site. I shot my own footage there. I, did, I got a, a very wide angle UFO shot, which was very interesting that night. Um, but I had pr proximity to the whole story. And I was, again, the, the compelling nature of my reporting overwhelmed the witness and, and, the, and Angela. So uh, they were, they, they just felt compelled to, to open the gates and let me in and, and, and have a look. Uh, so I, 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 I later on interviewed Angela a couple of years later and uh, that interview highlight, a highlight from that interview became uh, part of the material that was used to create uh, uh, episode one of Encounters. Nice. And now I have to go watch that. There you go. So uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to be included. And uh, just by, you know, by my life circumstances and by my persistent work in these areas of research that interest me, uh, that I've um, been able to publish in and share, share with the public, it's attracted the attention of people who, who know sound, who know visual. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, my work has, uh, as, again, as, as esoteric as, or as abstract as my, uh, as my premises may seem, um, the, the work is compelling, the findings are compelling, and uh, it, it keeps me interested in it. I guess it's kept audiences interested for a long time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we'll get into all of this right now. But I was going to ask you, uh, John, in, in terms of UFOs or UAPs and everything that's going on right now in the White House and with the whistleblowers that have come forward. What are your thoughts and opinions on, on these things? Do you think we're going to ever actually get tangible answers? Well, this is a very interesting question because the question we're discussing pertaining to UFOs is actually about human behavior. Because we're we're talking about people sharing information, right? In, um, in, 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 in where 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 there's lots of uh, proximity to security settings. So, you know, is that going to change? Will security protocols for top secret classified information in the United States, will those change anytime soon? And I have to say, uh, based on the way uh, the government continues to withhold John F. Kennedy assassination files, I mean, th those, are going to be, those are going to be in storage for, another, for decades more before any of that stuff is reviewed again for release. I think President Trump had promised to release files, and uh, he was... Uh, I don't think he was entirely successful. There's still files that are not released there. So right. my faith in breach of security happening, unless it's on sort of a, a treason basis, uh, is very limited. Uh, but that, you know, it does it, because of the high profile nature of espionage uh, or um, uh, data, um, people, uh, you know, fi playing finders keepers when they're see like Edward Snowden, uh, those kinds of scenarios where those folks are, t are taking data out of uh, institutions. We have a lot of problems with espionage in Canada, for example. We have uh, Chinese scientists apparently taking data out of our, you know, expensive labs and taking it back home to the communist government. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing problem. So I think it's more likely, in other words, what I'm really leading to is it's more likely through that kind of espionage or um, uh, misuse of privileged access that the public will get this information, it's much more likely than that the institutions that are founded on security or information security, that those those will fail systematically. It seems less likely that that will happen. 
Now, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of, this is, this black, what we've created is such a social black or cultural black box around the subject. It's possible, you know, it could be anything in there. You know, the government's super secret vault, you know, wherever that's located, where they're hiding all their stuff. Right. That was what was alluded in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark in the final scene. Where the ark ends up in the Smithsonian uh, warehouse from hell. That's right. <laughs> Some people really did not like that movie. What was it about it that defended them? I think everything. <laughs> you know how most people are on online. They hate everything. Well, I, I I would have to go up to Rotten Tomatoes and see. It. Let's let's do the Rotten Tomatoes test on that film and see if okay. see if it's. Uh, <laughs> let's it's, do that. Let's stood up. No worries. I, I, I think that that um, this idea that that information gets can get buried in in um, huge bureaucracies is um, is not is not a is not a strange idea. Right. Uh, so then it comes down to what's our what's what is the opportunity of today? Um, you know, from my limited point of view, the opportunity ninety three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So we're talking about the seven percent that didn't like it. Well, yeah, we're we're talking about a a lot. You know, there's a smaller minority out there that uh, I think just hated the movie. But these are <laughs> these are people that hate any sort of uh, movie from the past. Oh, I see. Because it was yeah. it's sort of sentimental. It's 1930s style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Art Deco and all, all those things that people enjoy. But the, of course, in, in the cinema history, a lot of the great you know Flash Gordon and other serials were of that area. The early talkies and such. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, I mean, uh, I can't remember all the names of many of them, but uh, the, the, cer certainly that was th this was of that genre of the of the serial, uh, you know, done done in done in a 1980s epic style. Well, it was it was a very successful film. I can't speak for you know for art; it's very subjective. Uh, but the uh, the notion that you know they alluded to uh, just as you know Hollywood will draw on these memes or these tropes. The, tr the trope about the government that has all the secret information is hiding everything. That's in that's in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's also in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which was the big you know 1970s uh, UFO uh, contact film, at least one of them. And uh, that film, you know, they, they they portrayed an entire elite. Oh, by the way, I by the way, I hate to interrupt you, but I, now I remember what people were saying online that no. the movie went woke. They're they're saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're saying they they ruined the classic. They're saying the series. Well, yeah, well, yeah, the franchise, the franchise. So there was a later iteration of the last year or two, I think, and I don't know how successful it was. I don't think it was a big hit, um, and maybe yeah, maybe at this time now the uh, the tone of Hollywood writing is is, is vastly different than what they were uh, you know, alluding. Probably to. Probably expecting, yeah, and that, well, that's that's that's, that's the case for most things right now. Star Wars. I mean, people criticize Star Wars. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I'm not. I guess I, I I don't keep up enough as a consumer of these franchises. Right. To, I don't. But, but it, yeah. But in terms of in terms of the trends that you're talking about, the you know woke and what it's what it has come to mean from you know from its original time, it woke woke used to just mean social justice awareness, like right. read a book and get educated about what's happening in you know right in your your own society. But right. it's become more. I, I think we're in a time of great extremes, and there's perhaps a lot of distortions of our, of our traditional or, or historic values. Right. I think a lot of people are just angry, though, John. And they lash out in all kinds of ways. Well, there is such a thing. And did you, I mean, do you think people are angrier today than they were 10 years ago? Probably not. I think it's probably about the same. I, I think this sort of inner anger is out there in today's society. You see it all the time. You know, you don't have to go too long on the online on the internet to see p outrageous behavior from uh, certain people people are, are dangerous people are, are are animals and very unpredictable got to be honest well pe people are exploring very uh high risk uh communication scenarios on the internet and i mean the the, the trope there is that people are, are willing to type things on a keyboard that that in a face-to-face -face they would never dream of of you know of expressing themselves in that way, so it's it's, it's kind of the online world in some ways has become this uh, reflection of, of of the physical, you know, the cyber world has sort of become a reflection of the of the the practical world, and in some ways it's a very dark reflection because it, it exposes perhaps the um, the kinds of talk, you know psychological or emotional toxins that people are harboring uh, that we may not see in polite society. 
but it gives it's it's, a, it's kind of like an indicator, so to speak. And at this point, this is where we're, this is part of certainly not the entire uh, the, the entire scope of what this is about, but the, the the incessant data collection on the internet. You know, there are certain organizations that want to test and measure public uh, tolerances and behavioral right. patterns to, to you know like to try to predict the next big social event or something like that. Right. So so in, in that sense, uh, people who have who exercise li limited self restraint in in their online communications are really uh, feeding data collection of agencies who want to uh, try to anticipate the next riot or the next uh, January 6 for or something like that. The, the, there's people working full time just trying to make sense out of those kinds of questions. And again, uh, folks folks who w w won't exercise practical restraint in, with their keyboards. No, not you know, at they all. May, yeah, they may. <laughs> well, the, you know, they may they may just be fueling things if if the people are are protesting for their freedom in, in such a way. You know, they may actually be surrendering their freedom, uh, you know, all their their personal treasures. You know, in, in traditional societies, there's such a thing as modesty. That's true. But there's another thing, another epidemic that plagues generations and generations that I've noticed that are mostly behind the Internet, that sort of culture, which I'm a part of myself. But th there is a few people out there that, you know, they, they're rewarded for such bad behavior. And those individuals are usually elevated to the top. And they become very popular online and they do a uh, very um despicable and uh, degenerate sort of things uh john well and so you know popularity and you know quality uh you know that can be this can be two very different things something that's popular may not be of a uh, you know, fine character it may be something that's uh, very rough and coarse but people like it anyways i'm here so, for it though john i'm not i'm not <laughs> I'm not um, disparaging this sort of thing as I'm someone who's a fan of the Jerry Springer show. Well, so <laughs> I'd love a good train wreck myself, but I, I could tell some of this behavior is very counterproductive for the younger generations. But I mean, I, I, we're screwed though. Some of these people were born behind the computer and that does uh, plenty of damage. Just talk to or, parents. <laughs> well, there's such a thing as fubbing. And so people are, right. people are using technology as a, as a means of social distancing. Uh, you know, recently there were reports of a groom who who got married using his uh, Apple visor. Oh my virtual God! Virtual reality visor. Really? He really? The groom, the groom wow. wore the visor to the wedding. Um, you know, some some people some people uh, kind of were kidding and saying, "Wow, this guy was like, you know, he he just blew the whole the whole thing." But That's right. Maybe people in that some people in that family were into that. Uh, I I think from a visual point of view, it kind of looks like people are distancing themselves. Using technology as right. a means of distancing, but really, you know, as a, as a person who's working in mental health, I must say, it, you know, what we're trying to distance ourselves from is our own un uncomfortable feelings. We're really trying mm. to escape our own feelings. It's, you know, there's different kinds of uh, escapism into, you know, technical technological snubbing or, or or whatnot. But at the end of the day, um, those are the things that we we have. To, you know, that's what we're left with. Our, right, the, and the uncomfortable. Feelings. It's it's concerning to me though, slightly. Not that it affects my life, but studies have shown, I, I, I saw this article, I think I might be, I might have read it wrong or something, but it said something about like 70% of uh, younger folks out, out here in America are unfit to serve their country due to mental illness and other things. Well, this is... I don't know if that's this, true or not. I mean, that might be a little sensational, but... This is the trope, obviously. This is the trope about <laughs> folks who are spending a lot of time at a desk you know, perhaps when they're uh, when they're of an age when they're they could have peak peak athleticism, they're they're rather you know caught up on intellectual pursuits on on a computer. Right. But 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 in terms of you know what made what made the opportunity the technical opportunities that exist in America today were you know the hard the hardy people of the past. You know they they didn't they didn't enjoy all necessarily all the refinements that people today can enjoy. Right. But there, it was their, you know, it was their good character that was that created the foundation. And part of that good character was they were they were fit and capable for all of the different demands of life. They weren't just good for one or two things. You know, they could they could respond to all the, all of the life situations. And even this goes back to even you know men men who could be fathers, women who could also be mothers. Just even those sorts of things. So these these kinds of uh, I guess you know in some ways uh, we're not as a as a, as a as a as an entire culture now really emphasizing those types of traditional values 
and perhaps uh, you know perhaps uh, there, there, I'm sure in every generation there are, there are some excellent athletes, but perhaps uh, you know we've 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 fomented a society that uh, may in some ways be un, be unfit for what the, the real world challenges you know are, we're, the country's going to have to face. That's crazy though. That's the power of the internet and technology. It's really. It's really hurt us, in, the, in my opinion, of course, it, it's really hurt us as a society to some degree, not fully, but there is that small percent that's really done bad to. Well, we've unle- we, we've, we, with, with the uncensored use of the Internet, we've unleashed all kinds of uh, voices who wouldn't otherwise get published in their local newspaper. Pandora's box, I like to call it. The Pandora's box of ideas, exactly. So, um, you know, this is... It's part of growth. Is uh, you right. know, if we bit off if we bit off more than we can chew, we have to find a way to work with that. Uh, you know, find some equilibrium. But yeah, there's there's a lot of extremes, and I you know I think it's because uh, you know we, if we know the kinds of uh, misbehavior that that adult humans can get up to without computers. I mean, uh, British Columbia being a hotbed of serial killers and other kinds of problems. That's true. In, empowering the population who's who's compelled to behave like that, predators. Uh, you know, and ch- you know, child predators and such, the right. Jeffrey Epstein's of the world, and such, true, yes. em- empowering them with these super instruments and, and artificial intelligence. And imagine if, if and imagine if Richard Ramirez had access to a computer and the internet and uh, these sort of uh, apps to meet people right away. Well, exactly. Be bad so news. We, we have we have as a society. I would just say that we haven't developed the, the character to match our technological aptitude. We, we just we just don't have we're not really showing that even in, even in just terms of, of a harmony and unity you know we're, we're in a time in, in North American society where, where there's huge divisions like major major social and political splits right like so much so that people you know in the last year have been making you know sideways comments about civil wars that's true a lot, lot of civil war talk has been going on um I'm sure that is something that's raised a few eyebrows to where you're at. I'm sure it affects uh, our friends in Canada, as I like to say. Well, the, the RCMP published a report, and it was leaked. There were Freedom of Information uh, published, uh, and so the public got a look at this warning that says uh, two things. One is the next uh, the next five years economically are, are just a, uh, a disaster. Oh, my. And two is that it's consi- the, from the RCMP or the federal police, the FBI up here. From their point of view, the population here is um, is a candidate for to, to, to go start having a revolution. We think about that very famous story about the truckers um, uh, that protested yeah. in, in Ottawa, mm-hmm. the Canadian capital, during the pandemic. Right. The, you know, the, the head count for that was not you know, there were, certainly there were people there. But there were only 60 trucks involved in that. Only 60? I thought there was a lot more than that. Well, there were, you know, they, but the numbers were not, there, this was not 10,000 vehicles. Right. It was not proportionally a representative population for the entire country. Although a lot of people were indignant about th- different things that had happened in that period of time. And right. could identify yeah. I, with, I was one of them. I, I was fooled. I thought there was a lot more uh, truckers than that. Well, the, the read that I get is that, no, it wasn't the majority of the population at all. It was just a very organized and vocal community. And group of people, yeah, getting involved and being active. Now, at the same time, I mean, this, this can be read in two different ways because, yeah. um, you know, you know, if you're going to do something constructive and progressive to help a society, well, a small group of committed people can be enough, you know, to make a big change. Or if you're going to try and disrupt and undermine a society, you know, commit treason or something. You don't really need that many people either. A That's small true. committed group, a small committed group can, can do a lot. In this case, they um, they upset the upset the government to uh, to a, a, a martial law. A state of emergency is what we ended up with for a, a week or two up here. You know, just suspended all of our, our rights and freedoms, essentially. Now, it wasn't like everyone was, you know, door to door and arresting people all over the place. That didn't happen. But it, but it's, it's terrifying that uh, it was the prime minister's instruction to do this. And uh, his party continues to say that they did the right thing. But uh, there's a lot of criticism up here, to say the least, about going to that extreme. They have, but in other words, there's laws in the books that they could have uh, enforced and solved, solved problems using existing law. 
So we're getting back to, you know, people are like perceptions of the prime minister here are willing to push extreme initiatives over using practical and, you know, precedent based approaches to solving problems. And do you do you like Justin Trudeau? I mean, out here, people seem to really hate that guy. Well, certainly, it's, uh, I have room. There's plenty of disappointment, to say the least. I was just about to say that uh, a gentleman um, who observed that event in Ottawa noted how the prime minister had refused at the beginning of, of, the, of, of the whole process to come out and meet the protesters. Like he couldn't be bothered to come out in the street and spend five minutes face to face, you know, man to man. He just couldn't do that. So one of these guys wrote a children's book about the prime minister who stayed in his bedroom and hid under his sheets. Oh, no. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> so I'm saying it's just like from, from man to child. Uh, That's pretty good. Is, his, apparently, well, the word is his wife had left him while he's while he's in in, in the leadership position. His, oh, his wife has left him. He was uh, had a terrible, just absolutely awful reputation for blackface performances. You're right. Just absolutely awful. And uh, furthermore, you know, so he he's been on uh, he, he had gone on um, diplomatic missions to places like India, but there were these sort of catastrophic uh, faux pas, like uh, dressing up in full traditional Indian costume and then uh, coming out dancing. Right. The, dance. the whole blackface thing, though, is very very odd to me. I mean, I, we, we've seen countless people do it. And I've always wondered, you know, that's not a, probably a good idea. <laughs> well, this, I, I think this says something about the dissociation, again, even at the up, the 1% tier of our, our culture. Uh, this gentleman's wife, uh, his, his, their family was actually ba based in Vancouver. But Pierre Trudeau's wife, Margaret Trudeau, who went on to become the, uh, the, uh, the partying associate of the Rolling Stones, amongst others. Right. This is all really, you know, old history, you know, 40, 50 years ago. But at that time, uh, the Prime Minister married a woman who was uh, maybe 30 years younger than him. And uh, she ended up leaving him while he was in office. Uh, and she went on to have a, a heavy partying lifestyle. Well, that's Justin Trudeau's mother. What I'm getting at is that people hang out in the uh, in the limo with, with the Rolling Stones on the regular in, in Studio 54. Right. Standing in line, you know, to get the, ne to get the next line. That's like... This that kind of says it all. Wavelength. They're kind of on a completely different cultural wavelength, and they have this. They seem to have this perception based you know, on, on this Justin Trudeau's performance here is that uh, uh, they, they they really have don't have to subscribe to any kind of uh, you know Canadian values. They, wow. they can they can represent some sort of elite values where that's where that's considered acceptable, like blackface at a party. You know, it's just it's we're a diverse society here. It's absolutely atrocious. To uh, bully other uh, members of our society based on the color of their skin. I, 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 well, I got to be honest. I'm not defending anybody here. I'm, I'm just trying to say that you know I have a sense of humor. It's a very vile sense of humor at times. I laugh at everything. <laughs> uh, but I mean, but the whole blackface thing—it never got a chuckle out of me. I just thought, oh, okay, well. That's a little weird, but it'll do what you got to do, I guess. But it, it's the same way I see how Hollywood in America, they just love to dress men in women's clothing. I just, I don't understand it. It's, I don't know. I mean, I'm, again, I don't, I don't have a problem with anyone doing anything it's in their adult life. I, you know, it's all good for me. I don't, I don't care. But to see it all the time with celebrities, it's a little bit on. Well, what Canada is, is busy rainbow washing our culture. And uh, w was uh, Easter in the United States declared the uh, trans day of visibility? That's right. Yeah, we have uh, something like that now. So th there, there are these urges to try to bring visibility to minorities, uh, which I think is important. But at the same time, when we're coloring the entire society as, you know, with one narrow set of values, I think we're really missing out. And I, I think it's estranging. I mean, if you look at the Bud Light sales, uh, they but and has your bush i think that's the company that's that they right. estranged, they estranged their audience yeah they really did did a number of their own uh, demographic there i'm not sure what they were thinking it was a bad idea from jump so i i, I think the visibility of minorities is a very important idea but uh you know trying to wash the whole society or blackface or whiteface or greenface the whole society uh, just with one narrow set of values at the state 
if you're not if you were a settler in North America, you you know you were from one of the the traditional tribes here, and they have lots of diversity and different ideas too. That's we true. To find, we're going to have to find a way in our lives to make room for the people in our lives, whether we, you know, we 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 voted for all of their ideas. Or yeah. We uphold their values. And we're that's really, why, like America, you know, we have all this sort of uh, diversity going on. And I'm not someone who uh, hates any of these groups, or you know, I, I no hate in my heart. That's for sure. But there are other countries where that sort of thing just doesn't fly. The only thing flying is you off a roof in some places. Well, yeah, and so, you know, we're talking about North America as a, as a hotbed of innovation and social innovation where new lifestyle opportunities exist that weren't possible in the old world. And, and that, you know, goes way back to the pilgrims. Uh, why would they move here? Right. Because they could express their lifestyle in ways that wouldn't be possible back in England. Uh, so at the same time, though, uh, you know, there's lots of pitfalls. I mean, not every road leads to, uh, you know, leads to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I'm That's true. Kidding. And you've got to be careful, though, too, here in America. There are people that will hate you for your choice in a partner or lifestyle, by the way. So I do understand that aspect. And it's a, it's a, it's a threat to anyone out there and everyone. America's pretty crazy, uh, John, depending on where you are. Well... Folks in America, you know, there's been so many opportunities at the same time the society is, is, is so wealthy that it's provided so many lifestyle opportunities, whether or not, you know, we, we agree with them or not. Uh, empires typically can support more sort of voluptuous ways of living than, than are possible in societies that are still developing. So, but, but whether or not, you know, every choice under our free will is, is a good choice, uh, just because we can make the choices, you know, are we, are we, are we, are we getting any wiser? Or are we still like infants? We're just adult infants. We have no idea what we're doing, and we're not learning anything from our experiences. <laughs> I think, it, I, you know, as, as someone again, works the health, I think I think the goal here is is to get wise. Adults are supposed to gain wisdom with the passage of time. We're not supposed to be constantly naive forever about stuff. You know, we're supposed to have to develop wisdom and make decisions and help to guide other people based on wisdom. Right. So. I, I think we're, you know, in some painful ways, we're developing some kinds of wisdom about different things. Like the, uh, you know, it, growth can growth can be very painful. But in terms of what people will ultimately do, I think here's an interesting case in point. For you know, for marginal lifestyles, mm -hmm. well, the, the, the drug culture in Oregon. That's right. They had a uh, an initiative to bring. Uh, I think it was you know possession of normally the hardest drugs like uh, heroin and meth, etc bring those into the legal framework so there was no criminal charges for possession. And uh, I think that program ran for a year, year and a half. I might would imagine, but John, would you want to live there? Well, I live in a very similar <laughs> political climate, I must say. I mean, like, you, you but, uh, but, like half of <laughs> but like Oregon, though? Like, what's going on out there? Uh, well, in, Vanco in Vancouver, we have, uh, you know, safe, safe uh, use zone. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, no well, arrest for heroin. Right. Uh, you know, and we have and we have clean, 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 clean hard yeah, drugs right. available for the users to prevent death from the from fentanyl overdose, for right, example, which yeah. is the huge killer. What I'm saying is that we're as West Coast as Oregon on, on this type of program, and safe safe injection sites were first brought out here, the first in North America, and now I think they're in New York as well. But what I'm getting to is that the. Uh, uh, the, 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 in Oregon, they they reverse their position. The, the the government has reversed its position and flipped the law back. I, I think I think it's I don't I, I can't remember if there's if, if, if a dead you know a start date when the laws go back. But they've determined that um, free and, and you know sort of free anarchy around drug hard drug use was not to the best interest of the society. And so what I'm saying is that it, that's a painful lesson to learn. Very. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it was a mistake, but it was a know, big mistake. Yeah, they recriminalized uh, the possession of small amounts. Right, and so, so what they're saying is is that we can't have a society founded on people um, engage, indulging in this crazy and in, in the extremes of addiction, destructive behavior that's costing everything else. Uh, you know, people who aren't if if, if they're only participation in society is to use drugs, then they're not. What, what contributions are the society missing out on? Well, and so we did, I, Oregon said we don't want that type of society. We want a, we want a, uh, a more balanced and harmonious society than what this is creating. Uh, British Columbia, where I am, we're still going ahead. There's the, 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 uh, the, the chief medical officer here is 
still has full support for the safe drugs. The government issued lab-tested stuff that's not going to kill people. So that program is still supported here. But I think it's a very interesting watchword, what happened in Oregon. But it's also, more importantly for this discussion, it's an example of things that we can try. And learn from. Learn from. But we may end up reversing our position. And that's okay to do so, I think. That's what it's all about. Folks who've had medical procedures as a result of a cultural decision or an identity decision, you know, it's not unusual for folks to have different ideas as they get a little older, you know, like become more adult. Wiser, yeah. And then they want to start reversing their surgical procedures. I mean, in some cases, I guess that's achievable. But, you know, some of our, you know, life experiments and, you know, trying things out and learning and living, some of it, these are one-way doors that we go through that we can't go back to. Some are very painful, like you're saying here. Anheuser-Busch can't go back in the time machine to the days before Bud Light became very unpopular. That's right. Damage has been dealt. And for that, they learned rather quickly, though, John. They knew. They knew right away after seeing their stocks plummet that way. They thought, oh, my goodness, we really dropped the ball this time. And they sure did. And a lot of other musicians out there that were very vocal at the time, like, for instance, Kid Rock, if you remember, which his whole gimmick is to play the sort of trailer trash sort of character. But it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, he went to, like, a private school. This is what I understand. So, I mean, yeah, there's that underbelly in America where people see that and they sort of gravitate towards it. They believe this sort of facade, in other words. It's pretty crazy. And my country just loved Kid Rock, by the way. It's some things I don't even understand. And I always use certain groups as an example, like the group Hanson, by the way, if you remember. I remember the name. There was like a group of three brothers. They were playing guitar and they had the most insane songs that just made me want to projectile vomit out of the car. I got to be honest, John. But for some reason, they were like on top of the billboards out there in the 90s. It was pretty crazy. Well, you know, entertainment business is extremely political. It is. Yeah, it's a very political game. What goes on? And I'm sure... I'm sure you know what's been going on um, in terms of uh, celebrities and some of the crimes that they've been committing. A lot of folks out there going after the young children. And you've been seeing that on that uh, documentary that came out. Quiet on the set, I think it's called. Quiet on the set. And so, there's a, again, this is, um, in some ways, is very beneficial for society to, to let the toxins break through the, to the surface so we can actually get awareness about the issues. Uh, I don't think we're done plumbing the depths of, of, of corruption in our, in our culture. There's, there's lots of things to be undone. Um, at the same time, uh, people can be fatigued. Uh, you know, sometimes people become, become numb to issues through too much exposure. But there's got to be, there has to be some, there has to be processes of reconciliation. As a society, we can't withstand another Penn State or, you know, the California University system or the gynecologist is, is you know, assaulting all of the, the female athletes. I mean, these these these, these crimes have been going on in our society. I, I can, and we we have we have to have some kind of uh, process around them. Um, but I, I think that uh, children children living in the West, uh, you know, that it's, it's an op, it's a world of opportunity and it's a world of, of serious danger and predatory danger at the same time. One of my stories tonight. Uh, talks about uh, children in, in, in dangerous, high-risk situations, but it also, also my, my stories tonight are about, particularly about um, development of men, men developing into men, and the different challenges men face or boys face in their journey to, to manhood. I think some of the, uh, the, the speech that we'll be listening to tonight um, speaks to that. So that, that's sort of my theme tonight is about okay. the, challenge, the challenges that the children are facing even today, to develop their full, full adult potential, to get you know, to complete the journey, the A to Z. And uh, yes, let's get right into it here. And 
we have the first clip here, and this is of uh, John Kirby. Yes, the uh, retired admiral, this is not his first dance at the White House. He worked under the Obama administration as well. Oh. Here, here he's uh, the Biden National Security Communications Advisor, and he's giving remarks on this uh, terrible event in uh, Russia near Moscow, the Focus City Hall theater attack. Uh, where I, I, I'm trying to remember my numbers. There's 150, 200 people dead, huge injuries. It was a, a giant uh, cultural uh, facility uh, with thousands of people in it. Uh, was set on fire and gunmen went in, you know, shooting people. Just a terrible, terrible terrorist, terrorist incident. So everyone's wondering, you know, what, what's the background? Who were the terrorists? Was it ISIS? Was it the Ukraine? Was the United States involved? I was curious. So here I am. I, I'm studying the remarks of the of the former admiral, and uh, I heard a couple of messages in the first clip. We'll hear about 20, 30 seconds of context what he's talking about, and then uh, he uses a little rough language here. I say, hear him say, it's the fucking way they gasped them, and after that I think he says, the mass terror was raid. I know. He characterizes the, the, this terrorist event as a raid. Very interesting language. Absolutely, and my goodness. I believe 130 died, by the way. Is that, is that the number? So I believe so. I, I, I mean, having attended many uh, events in theaters and cinemas in my lifetime, I, I just couldn't imagine how scary that would be. Oh, my God. A military style assault. I can't even imagine that, John. I would, I would lose my mind if I saw a gunman open fire in any sort of uh, massive uh, environment, like a big gathering of sorts at a game, a theater. And I saw people getting gunned down. I mean, I'd probably have a heart attack. Well, my goodness, so extremely, extremely upsetting, uh, you know, some, some sort of a crime has happened here. Uh, I, I'm interested in seeing if there's more information, and uh, whether, whether I'm exposing good, bad, or ugly, I'm, I'm exposing something. I think right. we're hearing more than just what was said at the podium. Uh, I'm, I'm joining the press corps, I'm attending the events, but I, I think I'm taking away a little something new. Here we go. Hey, I'm going to thank you in advance for your patience. <laughs> I do have a few things I, I'm going to try to get through here. Let me put the cheaters on. Um, first, before I go through what I prepared to talk about, obviously we've all uh, seen the reports in the video coming out of Moscow. This uh, violent shooting at a, looks like a shopping mall. Um, can't speak much to the details of it. I mean, this was all just breaking before. I came on out here, so we're uh, trying to get uh, more information, but uh, really would refer to... Uh, Russian uh, authorities to, to speak to it. That one's pretty interesting. Yeah, and so this reference to gas, and I thought, um, on a way back look, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, there was an attack on a location called the Dubrovka Theater in Russia, and at that time, the, uh, there was a hostage taking, and the police attempted to, to uh, break into the building and get to the hostages. They used gas in that uh, rescue effort, and as a result of that, some of the hostages died. Right. So I thought this was a very interesting um, idea about gassing, and was the admiral foreseeing that they would, or was he, was he remembering a, a, a similar raid in the past where gas was used as part of the rescue effort? Um, but uh, other elements of the speech, these are the raid, the word raid is what I hear twice, and uh, you know, a raid is sort of like an organized uh, party, like a a raiding party, isn't that the term people use? And, you know, it's, it, it, in military language, that's not a, an unfamiliar idea of a raiding party, as if this was a, a military operation of some sort, or it, was, it, it had the aura of, of an organized raid. Uh, and lastly, he, point, he uses the word, I know, the words, I know, this, uh, this affirmation. It's a very, um, very strong affirmation. Uh, like linking, uh, linking the idea of the raid, or translating what appears to be mass terror was actually a military operation. It's sort of like he really seems to be enforcing this idea that he has privileged knowledge about the origins of this event and that it, there's some military organization around them. 
Let's play that one more time. Really would refer to uh, Russian uh, authorities to, to speak to it. Now, I could totally hear that part, by the way. Hmm. It's the fucking raid. They gassed them. I, I could definitely hear that. So, so he appears to be, you know, connecting with the event and, and, and perhaps uh, seeing it in a chain of events of, uh, related to other uh, assaults on theaters in Russia from the past, like the Dubrovka. One more time, for those that want it. I'm sure you're out there. For uh, uh, Russian uh, authorities to, to speak to it. My, my, my. So what people say forwards and what their uh, backward speech may reveal can be um, a very, offer a very compelling window into the psychological processes of the speaker and perhaps their history or uh, their activities, their associates. Here it seems it just seems that the uh, the, the White House National Security Communications Advisor seems to, to be closer to to information um, about these events than he's perhaps letting on. Let, let's let's drift into the the next uh, clip from from Mr. Kirby. Right. And by the way, I just wanted to quickly ask you this question: Do you think a reverse speech would be like a valid form of communication, or do you think would it would be labeled for most people, which is pseudoscience, especially those listening to this for the first time. Well, uh, w what we're coming into here is the notion of speech communications. And speech communications from a, a studied point of view, is, there's no uh, one theory uh, that encapsulates all the speech communication phenomena that humans exhibit. There's competing hypotheses. So where science is at in terms of defining what is or isn't speech communications or the nature and origins of speech communications is, is there's, no, there's no certainty at all. There's competing schools of thought and we're gathering data. We're continuing to gather data and try to make sense out of, of what we're observing. Uh, so I, I say what I'm listening to are speech communications in so much as uh, native, in this case, native English speakers and listeners can identify words. And furthermore, that uh, in, in the history of my findings, that the words really do pan out to be not just like um, data, but they're they're actually information. What is being expressed are, are is f factual information about events, past, present, and future, or distant events, and the, those facts are uh, validated and verified. Uh, they become they become publicly known. Uh, even even if it's if it's only after I, I publish, uh, and we'll we'll see an example of that tonight, a story that I ran, and then the speaker themselves, uh, they, they they revealed that, you know everything I said was on target. So. Right. I, I hope that answered some questions for for the listener out there, because I'm sure these are some these are one of the many things I'm sure someone's uh, probably asking right now and wondering. But well, what is speech communications again? Science. Yeah, that's another. Yeah. Science doesn't really have one position on this. There's multiple schools of thought about what what, what speech communications are and where, and where they come from. Uh, if you, at the same time, we recognize that most people who are listeners to radio shows are, are have functional. Uh, they, they they understand language well enough to recognize it if if it's occurring. Sometimes my critics have debated me. And uh, I, I have a very funny, uh, humorous way of of ending those debates. So, in the first very first round because you know one of the questions that come up is 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 john kelly competent to interpret english language speech speech communications is john kelly competent when he's making these claims i heard someone say this or that is that based on like english language competence or incompetence but you see the critic who might ask that question is is formulating it in language and they're expressing it to me with under the assumption that i actually understand what they're saying that's right. So I would say there's some validity to um, this, in my opinion. 
Well, uh, in terms of the, the, te the testing the information that's coming through in, in, in what I refer to as speech communications, uh, that's that's really hard and concrete. It's so hard and concrete that it's just it's really just stolen stolen the spotlight in, in so many situations. You know, there's so much interest in my work because yeah, of there, that. There is it's something there, though, crazy. John. In other words, uh, yeah, it's, this is a tangible. The tangible is that the measurable outcomes of the findings. In my case, when I said that, uh, you know, President George W. Bush was super interested in a missile attack on Baghdad. Right. You know, I said that. 18 months before the, the, the bombs fell. So um, I wasn't the only person talking about that subject, but I was basing my claims entirely on these findings. I wasn't, I was never showing up making claims with no findings. It was all findings driven. So if I was successful in pursuing, you know, using this as a uh, trailblazing tool in, in, to, you know, develop information pathways and threads of understanding, uh, other, other people can, can replicate that. Although I have to say that um, in terms of actually you know, forming a school or institution, while that I've, be, I've been uh, in discussions with people about doing just that, about actually you know, form, running formal trainings to develop this aptitude and such. Okay. Um, that hasn't really translated. I came out of an environment where there was a school in, in Southern California uh, where, that I was affiliated with, the Reverse Speech Institute. Oh. Uh, where was this? Time, where was this located, John? Uh, this <laughs> was. I'm trying to remember. If it was Fallbrook or Bonsall. It was. Uh, it was uh, north northeast of uh, San Diego. Oh. Okay. In the avocado orange growth country. Uh, yeah, I think it was Fallbrook, and so um, at that time, this is the mid mid uh, to late 1990s. And I was a uh, I was a remote student for that program, uh, but I, I I also made visits down to the to the offices and stuff. So I had lots of proximity to the school. Nevertheless, what I'm saying is that that was organized as a school, and there was a community of learners. Um, that you know, we, there was community at that time. But uh, when I broke with the school, I kind of broke with the community. You know, I broke with the whole thing. So I never I never really recreated that. The you know, the community that I built was, of course, the community of clients in, in my therapeutic practice. I built that community. And uh, for a period of time, I, you know, I built a, a, a substantial media community as well. And I guess I still, through people like yourself, I still have those connections. But again, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't form a huge institution with a, like a formal dogma and, uh, or start a church or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, you, you didn't know? have like a cult or anything. Yeah, exactly. That I was, I was really avoiding, avoiding all, all of that, and trying to just do productive work. That was really my ambition, and why I spent so much time in the air trying to reach audiences because I really wanted to do uh, the private session work. Uh, it was that was that was why I took the crazy risks of like you know uh, inter interrogating the National Security Communications Advisor. I mean, <laughs> who does that, right? Like, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I'm going. You know, I'm taking this next level because I'm saying it's it's more important to me that the potential for this. Uh, for people who can benefit from working in a facilitated session, uh, it's it's worth more than the risks of uh, you know potentially rubbing shoulders with the, with the powerful uh, political or military figures. And by the way, I'm not sure if I could get this file open here for some reason. Okay, so the next clip isn't going to open. Oh wait, never mind. I got it. Never mind. Good to go. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was clicking on the wrong thing here. I hate when that happens. Yeah, and it was muted, so I thought, oh, wait, I'm clicking the wrong thing. But this is the uh, Gives You Corpses. Yeah, yeah, the interesting clip. Here we go. Again, this just broke. We're taking a look at it, but I would disabuse you at this early hour of any connection to Ukraine. Well, uh, the Crocus Theater, I mean, uh, hundreds of dead bodies, corpses in messages, uh, but the, a reference to the Pentagon, the Department of Defense. This uh, Mr. Kirby, uh, he's a senior uh, military and political figure in the United States. Uh, perhaps in his world, nothing happens on planet Earth without the Pentagon knowing something about it or having something to do with it. That's right. One more time. There is no indication at this time that Ukraine uh, or Ukrainians were involved in the shooting. But again, this just broke. We're taking a look at it, but I would disabuse you at this early hour of any connection to Ukraine. 
I would agree. The Pentagon definitely gives you corpses. Absolutely. And of course, this was our taxpayer money going to waste, I would say, John, in another endless war. Uh, stop all wars, John. <laughs> well, you need, you, you, you need force to, to do that as well. You see, this is all very difficult. Uh, you know, so certainly there is, uh, uh, going back to the Vietnam era, uh, Americans protested, uh, yeah, you know, I'll fight for a just cause. Right. But what we're doing, what we're doing here, there and everywhere else, uh, I don't, I don't see, I don't see America's defense at stake in any of this. I don't see America's interest in, in any of this. You know, who who is benefiting, uh, you know, who is benefiting from the Ukraine war? Not the Ukrainian people, not the Russian people. Uh, it's uh, well, and the, mil the military complex out here is gathering all kinds of information on all the weapons that we've been sending out there. We are collecting data, basically, we're, and learning about for further learning about the art of war and all the drone strikes that are going on out there. All the, all the Ukrainians that are raining hell on the Russians right now. I've been looking at countless footage online, uh, John. I'm not sure if you have, but I've been seeing some very graphic things. And yes, there's plenty of corpses and uh, plenty of drones just shredding people. It's it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Well, the uh, yes, uh, this uh, the, the the death toll uh, in Ukraine uh, is terrible. Uh, but we're talking about data mining, which we had talked about before. Oh yeah. Use of social media as a data mining My goodness, collection yes. point. Well, a, a battlefield as a data mining collection point. We're, we're not only collecting information on on the NATO weapons; we're collecting information on the forms of the Russian weapons. Oh, so yeah. we get the Russians to shoot off their load. We get to see how it actually performs without necessarily exposing our right. you know, our frontline people without even being there. Exactly, and it, it's interesting what's going on around the world. It seems like there's going to be another. A conflict I'm pretty sure either this year or next year I'm sure we're gonna see another big event uh, John I'm not sure if you feel that way but I feel it in the air well the, you know the, the general tone uh, people are every every week people are concerned about World War three and we've been getting you know if you look at the the tone of some of the domestic uh, messaging in the United States they're uh, there was a height, heightening of public awareness of uh, use of bomb shelter uh, in Manhattan. There's public signage that went up in the last year or two since this war started in Ukraine. There's public signage, public signage in the United States now in major cities pertaining to access to bomb shelters and what to do in case a nuclear bomb drops. That's right. Yeah, That's, that, that wasn't something, I mean, that, that was in the background, but not since the 1950s. Was this, you know, you, you go to school in the morning, you salute the flag, you sing the national anthem, right? And you and you do the you do the the nuclear bomb uh, safety safety check. That's right. And um, there was a commercial playing in NYC, a public sort of a commercial here, a public service announcement commercial. I'm not sure if you've heard it, but I got that audio here for you, John. Let's play it. So there's been a nuclear attack. Don't ask me how or why, just know that the big one has hit, okay? So what do we do? There are three important steps that I want you to remember. Step one, get inside fast. You, your friends, your family, get inside. Get inside and, and hide. no, staying in the car is not an option. You need to get into a building and move away from the windows. Maybe that's Step what the Prime two. Minister of Canada would Stay would. inside. <laughs> right. Shut all doors and windows. Have a basement? Head there. If you don't have one, get as far into the middle of the building as possible. If you were outside after the blast, get clean immediately. Remove and bag all outer clothing to keep radioactive dust or ash away from your body. Step three, stay tuned. Follow media for more information. Don't forget to sign up for Notify NYC for official alerts and updates. And don't go outside until officials say it's safe. All right, you've got this. Well, good luck. Uh, count the all media devices to uh, go if there's an EMP uh, sort of attack or any kind of, uh, you won't even need an EMP these days. You could just hack it somehow.
Well, yes, I mean, so many dangerous scenarios. And so this this PSA was part of that wave, that information wave of propaganda, you know, a public domestic facing propaganda about contingencies in nuclear warfare. And this was not stuff people were talking about 10 years ago. I mean, the potential has always been there, but it's not been the part, a defining part of our culture, whereas now it's politically correct. Uh, to talk about it with the, you know, it's which is uh, which can is sort of part of this maelstrom, this international maelstrom of of rhetoric, uh, where, where people are foreseeing the, uh, the the proximity of World War III, whether it's the uh, Russian diplomatic corps, or uh, people saying that it's it's war in Israel and Gaza that's the tipping point, or is there going to be you know U S war over Taiwan with China? Is that the tipping point? It's kind of like we're all sitting back and maybe maybe some of us feel, you know, we'll be exonerated in life. I guess we won't have to struggle anymore because everything we're fighting for will end. You know, it's like some people are people are kind of hoping that's going to happen. But I think that, you know, we got this far without a World War Three, even though we had the potential to, to create one since the end of the Second World War. We didn't achieve that. And there's something, you know, there's there's something more than just a. You know, uh, than just an accidental flick of the switch or somebody waking up on the wrong side of the bed that's going to lead us into that. Uh, I I think that it is a very frightening time. Uh, I, I these these are questions, existential questions that I didn't have to think about for most of my adulthood. Right, and now and, it's uh, be, and now it, it's, it's almost coming to uh, into fruition, John. Here in uh, twenty twenty four, it's pretty wild. All those bad TV movies that I watched right. in yeah. the nineteen seventies, you know, it's like some of them may be coming to pass. I, I, am I am I the kind of character? Am I fit? You know, am I fit to withstand that kind of torment? I, I really don't know. I think that in terms of the, what what the what the uh, the sophisticated say is, it would rather get they would rather be taken down in the first flash in the event of a nuclear attack rather than be a survivor because the conditions of survival will be so terrible, including nuclear winter starvation, you know, on and on and on, uh, the hardship of, of that survival might be far more than most people are willing to handle. My goodness, yes. And uh, another thing that just came to mind, I wish I had uh, told you sooner that I, I was interested in perhaps a clip from uh, Putin. He's been very vocal about these uh, threats he's making to the West. Well, I did uh, attend the Tucker Carlson interview. Oh, okay. Although it was, uh, it was, you know, the voice of the president was in Russian. Right. I, 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 so I hadn't, I haven't really been able to uh, lure uh, the, the head of the Russian Republic in, into my my domain just yet. Although, so some of his uh, his uh, his spies in North America certainly came under my surveillance, and they, they, well, they let's just put it this way, they had already been extradited from the country, but they didn't do very well under under my lens. Ah, okay. My, my, my. Well, let's go to the next clip here. All right. So now, uh, you know, another topic uh, that's uh, that's contemporary uh, cyber currency. I mean, who wasn't interested in Bitcoin investment? That's right. Potential yeah. al alternate currencies, the old bank system, uh, you know, stepping aside for the new. Well, uh, in, in the process of that, it's really been a wild west, to say the least. I mean, the instability of these institutions like the FTX currency exchange just just incredibly disruptive. I mean, if people have money to burn, I guess it's no problem. But perhaps for the average investor, this is just way too wild of a market. Uh, so Sam Bankman-Fried was sentenced to 25 years over uh, uh, fraud and misuse of funds. Uh, he, uh, under under inquiry, uh, even during this interview that I studied from the New York uh, Deal Book Summit back in t end of 2022, he openly talked about um, d d taking funds allocated, you know, to one account and you know uh, just mo moving them to other accounts for other purposes. Just just like absolutely zero money management concept. I just like just a, a total an financial anarchy is what, is what was happening. Nevertheless, the 25 year sentence really st struck. Uh, I got a lot of people's attention. and I guess it was intended to to um, to raise the standards in the, in the cryptocurrency marketplace that people are not going to get away with uh, committing fraud. Well, as a, let's say if I was a potential investor back in, at the deal book summit, I was listening to Sam Bankman Fried. I, I wonder what I would hear. You know, what would I hear? W would he tell me that this is an awesome, sweet deal and I should get involved? Or would I be hearing some red flags that that's might good, warn me that's away? That's a good question. Yeah. Could I save my investment money for something better? So that was that was the uh, thinking when I went in after after the sentence had been uh, uh, issued. 
I thought, well, what what were what did people see in, in Mr. Fried? Let's so I suggest let, let's play that clip from the Deal Book Summit. It's he, you know he talks like a like a someone who's to, the total trader. I mean, everything he says is it's like if you're, if you're into trading, you'll understand what he's saying. Otherwise, it's kind of cryptic. He had a serious drug problem, by the way, and my goodness, eleven billion dollars is what was being reported. And uh, yes, let's um, play that clip of our friend Sam Bankman Fried. You like the way I added that, our friend. <laughs> yeah, we know we're not biased right here. <laughs> here we go. Look, I wasn't running Alameda. I, I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know the size of their position. Um, uh, a lot of these are things I've learned over the last month that I learned as I was sort of frantically digging into this on you know November 6th, November 7th, November 8th. Um, uh, and and uh, obviously that that's a pretty big mistake on Mark. That's a pretty big oversight that I wasn't more aware. Um, I think I was, you know, scared of, um, I was nervous uh, because of the conflict of interest about being too involved. That trauma gets you big fear. I could definitely make that out. Uh, the other one hears evil as if uh, he, some kind of a pronouncement about uh, moral turpitude in the FTX world. Uh, he, he's, he's presenting in some ways as the consummate traitor, but he, he's deeper than that. He's not so, in other words, he's not so shallow according to my findings. He, in other words, the concept of good and evil relates to having a conscience. People might say like his behavior was unconscious of conscionable, you know, mm -hmm. like he was, he acted as a person who had no conscience uh, in, in his corruption. But here it, it does seem he has some kind of a, um, a measuring rod or a compass telling the difference between good and evil. Uh, it's very interesting. And furthermore, he talks about a trauma, uh, which is uh, something that, you know, people who are interested in, uh, in the language of therapy well, here, here's a, a subject, unconsciously, as if they're talking in their sleep, talking about a trauma, using that word. Um, so he's, it's as if when he's talking about FTX and the opportunity, he's, he's making a comparative statement. Unconsciously, he's, he's relating it to some kind of a trauma event, like you know, getting sentenced for 25 years, I guess. Is, that would be a pretty big trauma. Oh, yeah. 25 just, years locked up in a, in a jail cell. That's, that is the worst thing. I mean, they did get him, right? They so did. It gets you, but but, right. but but more but more so, it's just that he's he he. It seems he's cognizant of some kind of a crisis, uh, serious enough to be described as traumatic. In other words, an upsetting problem, perhaps something that was long term or couldn't be solved, and it was affecting his uh, state of mind. It gets to him, and he compounds that by talking using another emotion word. He says, "Big fear, trauma, and fear." This language is rich in therapeutic insight into the mind and, and emotional life of the subject. So when I see these flags, he's flagging fear, evil, trauma. I'm going, is this my investment? Is this my investment opportunity? I, I would, you know, it may sound very fickle on my part to just so quickly dismiss somebody, but now these were the uh, subconscious thoughts, I guess you can say. Uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, unintentionally, he disclosed more than he may have consciously intended. Correct. To, to, so for the for the listener who was in this position where we were studying the speech signal from a different uh, uh, time uh, perspective, then uh, we were privileged to this kind of information. I'm I, I'm doing this after the fact. I wasn't there at Deal Summit, and uh, you know I wasn't there when he was sentenced either. I'm not. I wasn't an investor in FTX. I wasn't directly affected by any of this. But it, this is a demonstration that if we, you know, if somebody today, if the, you know, the next Sam Bankman Fried is out there pitching and trying to attract investment, you know, can we do a little extra due diligence using this, this technique? A part of me doesn't believe that he was in charge of uh, many of these deals, though. Well, uh, he's the figurehead and maybe, you know, he's the sacrificial. I think he might be the patsy, yes. Pat, pat, patsy in this case. Uh, I mean, look at all the celebrities that were involved in this crap. In terms of as promoters, yeah, uh, there were there was there's definitely um, you know there's definitely let's say protectionist interests in 
in, uh, by, it's a, it, but in human dispensation of justice. You know, it's impossible to get 100% objectivity when, when humans are involved in, in the whole process. So, yeah, I mean, it's I think I, I think there's a lot more uh, about this case that, of course, didn't make it a court. Well, uh, I think that if, if you look at the stability of the economy or the economic system, uh, that losing that much money right. is kind of a sign of incredible national instability. Oh yes, and so you can't you can't be messaging to the public that that the banks are going to collapse or anything like that. You can't be messaging that stuff. You have to be messaging stability. You know, if you want to have a nine to five job in the media, he'll probably get a reduced sentence uh, over time. Is what I'm thinking. I don't think he's going to do the whole twenty five. Well, it is an interesting point, and there's many different ways that could come about. One of them, though, could be the resentment that he uh, fostered amongst the investor community. I mean, who, who's to say someone might not try to take a hit out on him? That's another thing, yeah. Someone might take him out there, and he's got uh, quite a few years ahead of him to look forward to that. Let's play that audio one more time, John. All right. Look, I wasn't running Alameda. I, I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know the size of their position. Um, uh, a lot of these are things I've learned over the last month that I learned as I was sort of frantically digging into this on you know november 6th november 7th november 8th um uh and, and uh obviously that that's a pretty big mistake on mark that's a pretty big oversight that i wasn't more aware um i think i was you know scared of um i was nervous uh, because of the conflict of interest about being too involved there's evil there's evil there's evil that's how i get me that trauma gets you big fear again hmm. i could hear i could hear both of those here's evil and that trauma gets you big fear i would say that one's pretty accurate in my opinion john in many ways yeah it, it seems it really does seem relevant to the speaker and uh the language is the language is there uh you know as a basis to to pursue this as an investigative lead for those who are, you know, who are fans of this case, I think there's a real opportunity still there. Right. And by the way, um, what are your thoughts and opinions on uh, cryptocurrency, by the way? I don't think I've ever really mentioned this to you, and I, I am curious about it. Not not myself, but uh, I'm, I'm always curious what your thoughts are on things. All right. Well, you know, in my personal situation, uh, I came from a family where trading was a way of life. So um, but the exposure to that as a child led me to have some skepticism about investment. So this, uh, this uh, you know, cyber currency, cryptocurrency as the you know, new and better form of investment, well, it just seems like the human flaws that, that create problems in the, uh, in the traditional investment industry haven't gone away. And in fact, the perceptions of opportunity in the, in the new markets have just attracted a kind of a... Uh, a, a, a hyper, let's say a hyper financial criminal. This isn't just your average financial crime. Sam moved back from free those billions of dollars. That's not your petty thief. Not at all. So, you know, this is the thing is that what we're really facing, no matter what the, uh, what the, what the flag we're flying, it's, it's flying under or what umbrella it's under, uh, is these tests of human character. That's what's really coming down. Mm. And that's, that's, you know, the, the wolf of wall street, obviously had some serious character issues and uh sam banker fried uh, just another scumbag i would have to agree with you my friend and again i don't think it was all up to him i don't think he was calling the shots but nonetheless still involved just like he, a lot of the just like a lot of the other folks out there that are in trouble like you know like epstein got in trouble and now he's gone they unalived him, as they say. And, of course, we have uh, Puff Daddy now. Diddy, that's right. Diddy. They, they, represent, they represent corrupt interests is, is what this really comes down to. They couldn't do all that badness by themselves. Right. Uh, and so if we have a, sh in the sense not to, you know, to diminish the importance of the justice system, but if we have a, you know, quote unquote, show trial to, to appease the masses, you know, a big drama trial with, you know, big, big figures, big, big press, big splash right, yeah, story. Like Johnny then, Depp. Then the, then the public can, can go, oh, I guess, pro you know, again, we, we become so perhaps numb to that due to the intense exposure. 
we become numb to the issue and we put it to sleep. You know, we think when when um, Harvey Weinstein is sentenced to jail, that the, the whole corruption issue has been drained, and you know that that, that the body has been made whole. But it's our failure and our willingness uh, to deal with potential instability in our own in our own culture and society, which is the problem. It, it comes back to what I'm saying is that the you know the cultural initiative uh, on the medium in broadcast world is is to project stability, but. Unless uh, we can we can have public discussions about about the instabilities in our own society, we're we're not going to be able to maintain. Uh, a, a, we're not going to be able to stand up forever. We're going to be like Baghdad Bob, you know that cat who was telling the world on on Iraqi television that the invader the American invasion had failed and things were going awesome, you know, on the streets and all, up to the very last minute until he was caught by the U.S. troops during the invasion of Iraq. Baghdad Bob was a diehard saying that things were awesome in, in Saddam Hussein's world. So it's like that. That's that's sort of the, you know, that's kind of like we're, we're the the bondage that we're in. You know, we we have we have a culture, we have to stand for a culture, we have a society, we have to stand for a society. If we if we're if we're always the critic, always the naysayer, you know, we never have anything nice to say, um that 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 becomes politically intolerable. Uh but that's but true. If we're if we're unwilling if we're unwilling to deal with the the really um, tough issues in society, uh, if 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 leadership is unwilling to 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 wrestle the horns of the bull, uh, and the the family people in the society, you know, they they can't they can't put up with that. Some somebody some innovator some breakthrough personality has to take some risks, and try to tr try to wrestle with these issues. And in my case. I try, you know, I, I wrestled with them in a very public way. Right. And there's people out there that are just doing what you are describing. And one of them is Elon Musk. And he's trying uh, very, very hard right now with that Neuralink of his. And that's one of the things that uh, I fear the most for the societies that are going to come up soon and have to deal with uh, actually merging with machine, which is, of course, the next step of evolution. Cyborgs. Correct. Well, I think for the disabled, and I and I this most well, current that, story about yes. the, the successful chip implant, that gentleman had no facilities that Correct. he's now gaining, and so that's obviously a social positive. That was amazing. Yes, he was playing video games. Yeah, I mean, so he was he was participating in the world that other folks, you know, who didn't have those disabilities. Uh, he was he was included, and so the society grew by one in that way. So those are very positive things. But I, I foresee a, a heck of a lot of risk. In uh, in those kinds of hum experimenting with human subjects Correct. using that kind of tech. I mean, just look at what happened with the internet, and look at cybersecurity and the ransomware. Eventually, there will be hackers that do the same thing with all these sort of uh, devices that you will eventually be planning somewhere in your body. As you say, it's, it, it could be it, what 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 starts as an asset becomes a vulnerability. Correct. Well, this is so. It's an interesting trade-off, and I, I certainly don't pretend to have any answers to these questions. But we, I, I acknowledge that we're living in a society where the the, the rate of technological change is extremely fast, uh, and, and you know that generational what would take generations in a hundred years ago is now being you know every year. Every year uh, now, yeah. You know, it's interesting though. I, I do love it though. At the same time, even though it does freak me out, but I am extremely interested in uh, the advancement of technology and the progression of technology and where it will take us i mean look at the, the jump that we had after the infamous 1945 crash of roswell look how leaps and bounds we jumped there out of nowhere john well it, 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 it's said to be like that that this is the, this is the you know convention but you know there certainly are critics about roswell that, that to say that perhaps that that was not such a hotbed of innovation and, and perhaps a more mundane explanation is also in order nevertheless uh, the atomic age started at that time, and so the, Roswell, uh, whatever it was that really happened there, occurred at the birth of the atomic era, and it's and I this I think uh, it's, it it is founded in factual history and, and undisputed, you know the the events uh, sur surrounding the development of the bombs that were used on Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that that was a turning point. Uh, we had never uh, wielded such mass destructive powers uh, would, uh, at at such a uh, on demand basis, uh, you know, it, it was at least at least within our known history, that the hum this was the first time humans were facing that kind of uh, situation where we could wipe an entire society off the map, you know, in one stroke. Very powerful stuff. 
And uh, yes, as we move along here, I mean, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So that's why I'm like, well, I could talk to you for uh, another hour easily. We will just have to come back and do it again. I'm, I'm telling you, man, we just got to get back and do it again. I know, but I'm not, I'm not, we're not done yet though. Well, all right, let's get on with well, this. We're, we're still got, yes. Let's jump into uh, the uh, Trump fears president. female character assassin. This is what I think. You know, I think that the president uh, is entangled now. The former president is entangled with powerful female figures in the Justice Department, prosecutors, district attorneys, uh, so many court cases going on, and as well as uh, litigants, uh, where he, he's been sued for and lost tens of millions of dollars in judgment. Uh, for one case involving what was described as sexual assault in, right. in New York. So I, I, I'm saying to myself, you know, this, the president's struggles with women. What is, you know, what's the archetype of the situation? What may be really going on? He's using the word bloodbath. It's a very dramatic word. Bloodbath. I like that. He's using it in his in his campaign speeches and and. Uh, but maybe not press, not the best for a campaign speech though. Well, he he was he <laughs> was talking in this event in Dayton, Ohio. He was talking about the auto industry, and he was uh -huh. talking about how there's going to be a. Terrible outcomes right, right. for for the for the auto workers if uh, his his vision of the future isn't realized, but the press uh, was criticized for taking this to the next out of extreme. context. Correct. Blood, blood. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. And so there, there's in my findings or my study of this this speech, I'm catching up with the former president on the campaign trail, and it it appears to me that there's a, a like a female character assassin fi assassin figure on his mind. Let's play the clip and see uh, what the audience thinks. Okay, here we go. Joe Biden won against Barack Hussein Obama. Has anyone ever heard of him? Barack Hussein Obama, or as Rush Limbaugh would say, Barack Hussein Obama. He used to scream out the name Hussein. But he, he was, uh, think of this, just think of this. Every swing state, Biden beat Obama. But every other state, he got killed. You think that's an honest election? I could give you a hundred different things. Yes, no one will show zero. Yes, no one will show zero. Yes, no one will show zero. Yeah, when you slow it down, it does seem, or it does appear, at least to my ears, that he is somewhat saying that, indeed, the woman shoots you. Yes, the woman shoots you is what I recognized. Well, I thought this was very Freudian. Uh, you know, if if we're not worried about issues uh, that will require the Secret Service, the right. Secret Service... Then what is the psychological dimension of this hmm. that the pre former president might be revealing? What was his relationship with his mother, a woman with a gun, is a highly uh, Freudian image. What was his relationship like with his mother? And it appears that uh, other folks are interested in that question, too. There was a story in Vanity Fair. Uh, the headline says, Donald Trump loves his father, Fred, but he rarely mentions his mother. I never heard him mention the mom, yes. So I, I, I was wondering, with this very Freudian female figure, hmm. you know, this with the phallus and you know the potential for violence or, or or whatnot, this very dramatic figure, was was that some kind of image of of his mother, and was he in some ways trying to uh, overcome what he felt were his mother's overpowering personality from when he was young? Are some of the conflicts he ended up with, the, the high-profile conflicts he ended up with in women in American society, was some of that the president working out feelings or misgivings he had about his relationship with his mom? What if, what if in a hypothetical parallel universe, uh, the president's mother wore the, wore, the, wore the pants in that household? Let's play that audio one more time. And I was going to say, you know, I kind of have lost track in terms of what is even going on with Trump. It seems like something is happening every few hours with uh, Trump, <laughs> to be honest with you. It's like, uh, I'm wondering, what, what did he do now? And in the same vein, I'm thinking he still even has a shot to become uh, the president again, John. Well, that's right. It, it, it's such uh, it's pretty an unusual. Wild. <laughs> yes. I, I, it, it touches on all these sort of unusual and extreme situations from presidential history, but I don't think any one of them encapsulated all the scenarios that President Trump is exploring in his life. This is right. like a this is like a movie, John. Oh, it's it's it's, it's incredibly dramatic, and it, it 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 ties into all these different dimensions of society: uh, po po politics, the courts men's rights women's rights uh, it's crazy and i and i have to look at it from an outside perspective i can be biased when i i talk about politics i, I gotta be right down the middle 
And, you know, a part of me was exposed to Trump in uh, different formats of media. In terms of combat sports, I would always see Donald Trump in these events going mm-hmm. back to the 90s. And I've always liked him for, for that. And then I kind of uh, got reintroduced to him yet again uh, later on in life uh, and seeing him as this sort of uh, reality talk show sort of figure. And then he becoming the president. And then, of course, his times even before becoming the president on the Howard Stern show. So my <laughs> my opinion has always been all over the place. I, I've never hated the guy. I've always found him, again, uh, entertaining, uh, whether he's right or wrong. And that's the problem with being, uh, I guess, uh, essentially American, John. I'm entertained by things that I probably shouldn't be. But at the same time, it's like I'm almost provoked to uh, vote for for someone that is uh, hated uh, as much as someone like uh, Donald J. Trump just for just for the laughs. I got to be honest, John, I I guess I'm guilty (laughs) of being bad now, but I I can't lie to you, John. And that's just my honest opinion. And to be honest with you, I even question the validity of voting itself in America. As you know, we love to sort of we we sort of like to uh, mix things up in other countries in terms of voting. So I always question the validity validity of my own country's voting system, to be honest. And I've been this way since the early 2000s as well. I, I've never changed my mind, even though I, I might be wrong. But I still think it's an unfair game. Well, I, I think your points are, are very interesting, and we should pursue some of the threads you've, you've exposed. Uh, w- one thing I would like to add is that in terms of the critical women in the Trump family, uh, you know, Trump's sisters are noted in the press for being very critical of the former president. That's right. Although not in, in a blatant a public way, but they had these, they, 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 one of them was a former federal judge. Uh, she was noted for, for being very critical of the president in private. I'm wondering if these sisters, these outspoken sisters, are representative of what the mother, what their mother was like. Mm. These strong personalities, maybe, maybe the Trump right. women, maybe they wielded a quiet power at home. It was, it was known to the family members who, who was, who was a boss, but uh, in, 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 in the public, they, you know, the men, the men were in charge. I understand that concept and that theory. That would make a lot of sense, though. Just my speculation. Again, as someone with a lot of, uh, I, I have a lot of experience not only as a clinician, but I've spent considerable time studying the former president, President Trump, uh, over the years. This is not my first time uh, at the rodeo, and uh, I, I think it's just an interesting, it's an interesting commentary uh, when we're using the word bloodbath on a regular right. basis or, <laughs> or our pol- political hyperbole. You know, he said just in that clip, he said that Biden got killed or he killed somebody, got killed. Right, in a political competition, right. it's hyper. It's very hyperbolic. Under underneath that, there's uh, different kinds of interesting profiling questions, and I think I I, I leave this in my files as a as as, as an interesting side long look at the uh, the president and particularly his sisters as perhaps of uh, the expression of a of, of a powerful mother figure from the past. Absolutely, and of course, these tyrants. Or these 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 rants. Sorry, I, I got mixed up there. These rants of sorts, uh, these tyrannical rants of uh, political pundits out there. I feel like a lot of them, since you know they're a lot, they're a little bit older. You know, they're elderly men. I feel like a lot of them are on medication as well, obviously. And I think it will affect all of them to well, certain President degrees. Biden, President Biden was cited for uh, right. substance Good use example. in the state of the. <laughs> So that's why I'm like, you know, I I think all of these guys are most likely a little pilled out, John. Well, uh, they're they're having seniors issues, nevertheless. But this is, again, one of the tropes of U.S. culture is that the the politicians, their life expectancy in office is just going forever. And they they look so bad, by the way. Biden doesn't look good. Neither does Trump uh, physically. They don't they don't look too good. I thought Nikki Haley could, could could have been a, a sure contender just based on her ability to articulate. Uh, well, yeah, you got a point there. <laughs> I mean, better than a lot of other folks out there. I got to be honest. So uh, this, you know, this appears to be the way the die has been cast. Biden Trump appears to be the contest. Yeah, it At seems least... like yeah, that seems like what we're gonna get served here. And I'm being <laughs> on. I, I got to be honest. I think Trump might even pull it off if if he doesn't end up killing someone. 
Well, this is going to be an outrageous situation for someone <laughs> in his in his position, uh, you know, and to, to turn around and recover. I mean, Mike Tyson turned around Oof. and recovered from, from, you know, a hellacious journey. Uh, so pre president's going through hell. Maybe maybe he'll get get to see the other side of this journey too. We're all standing by, watching and waiting. I I, I don't like to necessarily comment too early, in the in the run leading up. Uh, but uh, you know the president, the ex president, is just a, he's just a candidate at this point. That's right. He's not even he's, he's the presumptive nominee. I mean the GOP hasn't even formalized. You that know I hate to say this, but there's been speculation that there could be maybe even a potential hit on the uh, president, the former president. Well, and so here, and so here, the clip also alludes to that in the most blunt way, which is crazy. That's why I'm hearing this, and I'm remembering that uh, there was a lot of chatter about that. I think it's late last year that that might be something that could possibly happen during the campaign, or even later on if he does become the president once once more. Uh, let's play that clip again, and then we'll we'll talk about that again. Joe Biden won against. Barack Hussein Obama. Has anyone ever heard of him? Barack Hussein Obama. Or as Rush Limbaugh would say, Barack Hussein Obama. He has to scream out the name Hussein. But he, he was, uh, think of this, just think of this. Every swing state, Biden beat Obama. But every other state, he got killed. You think that's an honest election? I could give you a hundred different things. He has no almost show zero. Yes, no one will show zero. Yes, no one will show zero. If he ends up getting shot by a woman, John, uh, let's hope uh, the feds don't come after you again. Again, yes, well, exactly. You know, this is definitely Secret Service uh, territory. Maybe he, uh, you know, he's going to be J J John Lennon by some Joanna Hinckley. Oof. Let's hope not. Let's hope uh, that doesn't come to fruition, but... These are rather interesting sort of things, and uh, we may well, in fact, see something like that um, in the near future. We're, lead with we're anybody. leading the audience. We're leading the audience to the perimeter of these kind of potential situations. We're right. not really committing to saying anything uh, other than saying we're, we're, we have we feel that as if we have proximity to these scenarios, and we, we're curious to know if they'll pan out by 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 publishing today. This is exclusive to your show. That's right. We have a chance. We have a chance to on the way back in a year from now to, to do or, or later to do a look back and see if this if this stuff panned out in any ways. If it had any meaning other than what we were discussing. I hope not. <laughs> I hope you know for our sake and our minds. But you know, um, John, I got to be honest with you. Uh, politics is very very crazy these days. It's extremely violent, and people are out of their minds if you aren't exactly on the same page with them. If you disagree on one little thing, that person automatically hates you. Now, you're the enemy. And no matter what side you're on of the equation, I try to stay away from uh, biasness and, and just try to observe from the outside looking in. But people get very heated when it comes to politics in America. Well, this is very true, and um, folks, you know, want to be visible. I think civic duty is a very important idea, and per civic participation is a very important idea in having a real society. So, people, if they're participating, doing some sort of civic duty through participation, then you know that's that's good for the society. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's also sort of a a culture now where people almost seem to want to appear as as the most having adopted or embraced the most extreme positions on different issues as if it, without without appearing as some sort of an extremist that, that they'll become invisible and I'll, I'll bring that back to the prime minister of canada you know i think some of the things he did were extreme declaring, declaring right. a national emergency over 60 trucks i think that's kind of extreme it was extreme he he got worried though and i'm sure people were pressuring him uh that's usually the way it goes um unfortunately and, uh, you know, there's another clip here, by the way, the, let's find, oh, the Dalai Lama. Let, let's go to that one, actually. All right, Dalai Lama. Well, I, I think this uh, really uh, touching story about uh, a very controversial situation that, that was captured on video. The Oof. Dalai Lama w was giving audience uh, to, 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 I think, in, uh, in, in India, and uh, a young boy, a member of a family, who was a uh, you know, devout family, um, had some contact w with the Dalai Lama in that in that instance, whereby the Dalai Lama encouraged the boy verbally to uh, 
uh, approach him and have uh, direct uh, oral contact yeah. with, with with the Dalai Lama's tongue. Suck my tongue, he said. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's it, it, people who were disturbed by this. I'm disturbed by that, yeah. They were criticized because it was it was said by the contingents around the Dalai Lama that the Western society really just has no cultural cultural conception of what of what Tibetans do and how Tibetan grandfathers will have uh, tongue interactions with with their uh, grandchildren. Well, good lord! Sort of, some sort of a sentimental you know expression. I mean, uh, you know the old the old trope was that uh, the Inuit kissed by rubbing their noses. I mean, people express themselves in different ways, but. Here in the West, we do have a cultural convention around uh, the eroticism of children by adults. It's called pedophilia. That's correct. But yes, yeah, suck my tongue is pretty insane. You know, French kissing with the Dalai Lama. I mean, is that the new way to get to Nirvana? I, mean, what <laughs> I guess if, so. I mean, is that, is that what people are thinking? I think it's atrocious. But, but nevertheless, this child, you know, as a member of that community, I think was under significant pressure. So he gave an exonerating statement after Ooh. the after, after that video went viral. And I think when I listen to his statement, he sounds coached. And in fact, what I believe what I'm hearing him say is, is the things that the coach is telling him to say, he's just repeating it verbatim back to them because he keeps talking about you do this and you do that. Anyways, uh, let's listen to the exoneration. This is the, the Dalai Lama's uh, uh, pedophilic uh, boy victim from my point of view. And he's exonerating the Dalai Lama's uh, uh, evident misconduct. Uh, in this statement from 2023. This one was wild, by the way, John. And when I heard this the first time, I nearly lost it. I thought, no way he said that. But oh yeah, he definitely said to suck my tongue to a child. And I don't know about you, John, but I was not uh, French kissing uh, anyone in my family, especially not my father or grandfather. <laughs> and you see, you see, actually, you see celebrities these days, by the way, uh, kissing their children on the lips. I, I see that, John, and I think uh, that guy is mentally disturbed. You should not be kissing that boy. And I, I'm looking at you. Uh, who's that? Uh, that I'm forgetting the, the name of the uh, football player I saw uh, doing that. Uh, again, um, disgusting. But yeah, let, I'm sorry to uh, mention that. Let's play this clip because it is pretty crazy. My, my, my. It was amazing meeting His Holiness and I think it's a really great experience meeting somebody with such high positive energy. It's a really nice feeling meeting Him and you get a lot of that positive energy. It's not just like that but once you get the positive energy I think you're happier and it's a better thing and you smile a lot more. It was a really good experience of all. So as a therapist who works with the survivors of uh, sexual trauma, childhood abuse, rape, etc., my ears were tuned. Uh, I heard the voice of a survivor of sexual assault. The words I heard, he said, he molested me. That's what I heard. And by the way, it was, I believe that was Tom Brady, by the way, in reference to um, the celebrity kissing one of their kids on the mouth. He's one of the many that I've seen uh, do that. Well, and so, you know, the modesty uh, is, is, uh, is a lost uh, art. Um, I, I can't really comment on, on you know, as I'm not, I'm not the Brady family's therapist. But, right, uh, exactly. I just don't know what's going on there. Um, I don't know. Let's, if, just, let's, let's just say yeah. as a therapist who worked <laughs> in this area, that this is a, right. an extremely uh, uh, huge crisis in North American society. There was a a U.S. Uh, was it a senator or a congressperson who invested the investigated the savings and loan scandal and the Boys Town child sex trafficking ah. to, to the to the, the um, Bush Senior White House right back right, in the end that. of the yeah the end of the in the eighties nineties mm -hmm. so that that was one of the major exposes on the underbelly in America of the trafficking of uh, street kids or kids who've been placed into care. In, in in like Boys Town, I, I, it was a Boys and Girls Club. I can't remember who was the organization behind that, but it's shocking. You know, the American the establishment institutions are failing the children. It was like a YMCA sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, something so, like so, that so, nature. So, so um, uh, I, 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 I have uh, that 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 document. The documentary about that is still on YouTube, 
And Franklin Savings and Loan Cover-Up is one of the, 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 the search terms. Franklin Savings and Loan Cover-Up and the Boys Town uh, Sex Trafficking. Those, just search those. And you'll, DeCamp is the name of the, uh, U, I think, the U.S. Sen state senator. Anyways, yeah, D D John W. DeCamp uh, investigated this. So, like I say, serious people have taken a look at this question uh, in the way back, and we're still here dealing with it now. And uh, w w there are B Buddhist criminologists who write about the uh, corruption of novice monks mm. in, in, the, in the monasteries. When a novice, which is a youth, first enters a monastery, they have apparently no social standing whatsoever. And so they'll seek out a more senior monk to, uh, to give them uh, you know, some kind of grace or social badge of merit. Uh, it's not unlike a prison scenario where a, 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 a new person is going to seek out a stronger prisoner. What I'm getting at is that uh, in Bhutan, which is a nationalized Buddhist state, you know, it's just down the valley and around the corner from from Tibet. Um, they're nationalized Buddhists there, and there's stories in the in the, in the in the the capital city newspapers on a regular basis about monks who are being arrested and charged with assaulting the novices. That always seems to happen, doesn't it? Well, the Catholic Church is infamous for this. Turns out Buddhism seems to have a similar problem. And so, from my limited point of view, that controversial video where the the uh, the La Dalai Lama was asking boys to kiss his tongue was just uh, a wake-up call to uh, Oof, a, outrageous. Sim a similar uh, level, of, level of corruption. It's outrageous. Were. It's as outrageous as Michael Jackson, John. As Michael Jackson or now Diddy. And now Diddy, correct. And you've seen how he behaved around the young Justin Bieber. Yes, this controversy, and uh, it really gets people's hackles up, the, the, this perception of, of pr predation. And you know, it's. I think the average person wouldn't want wouldn't want that in their in their neighborhood oh, in no. their living room. No, no, no. They, they would reject it when we when the public sees that it's infuriating. It, it's infuriating. You're talking about angry public. Well, people are angry about some of these infuriating situations that we're cooking up in our society. Oh yes, it's all downhill from here. We we have <laughs> peaked in society. I think, John. Do we have a culture that's worth defending? I mean, if, uh, if, if, I know. if the, kids, the kids don't want to go to the armed forces, are they saying, are they rejecting our culture and saying we don't have anything worth, worth standing worth for? Worth fighting we for. To, we have to become people who are worth standing up for. I hate to say this, but we are of a lost generation, my generation included. It's lost a, to what? Lost to everything. I mean, again, I think the internet really has screwed up most of society. And television, I, I think it's ruined everybody. Not just here in America, I think everywhere. Well, there's certainly different problems. I I, I grew up uh, watching the boob tube, um, so so, and I cut it I cut it off. By the time I was twenty or early twenties, I stopped watching television. I'm still emerged in and having to know these things, but I could see the effects it has on people, and it it's just it's not good. You could tell they are influenced by all these things they see. They're they're influenced by all the bright lights, huh, John. Is television, is technology as as a te as as a technology, is technology bringing people closer together, or is it creating more distance and separation? It's driving uh, them uh, against each other, but also, uh, in some cases, bringing them together. I understand that, but I miss the times when we weren't all so connected. Well, yeah, that, that's very interesting. As notion of of a time, as you say, when we had uh, we had letter mail. But uh, maybe we didn't have uh, telegra telegraph yet. You know, we didn't have the instantaneous sort of instant uh, instant satisfaction of you know, pressing a button and sending, you know, publishing something or sharing something like that. Yeah, now we're all just um, seeing gratification. Yeah, it's just right away, and I think it's sensory overload for a lot of people, and we're seeing a lot of uh, that sort of behavior, that misbehavior, that degenerate behavior. We're seeing people that are violent and acting out. They have no actual outlets. And the internet, I'm sure, it depresses some people out there. Social media uh, drives people insane. And I've seen it time and time again. People really are losing their minds over um, most things they see in front of them. And it almost seems like they are almost even addicted to it. There, there's a lawsuit, at least one lawsuit against Facebook that I'm aware of, uh, where I think it was a school board, and they accused the um, social media website of, of you know, corrupting the minds of, of the of the young audience. Oh my! That, that their participation in social media was was having a detrimental effect on their development. I agree with that. I, I think there is a sort of 
something going on with the developing mind of uh, minors and even you see it in even in older folks as well you sort of i i should i don't even want to say this it's not even politically correct to say this but you almost inherit a form of autism by being behind the internet and learning the internet culture you're kind of mimicking someone that really is diagnosed with autism and <laughs> in regard you kind of pick up those traits uh, well it's crazy I, I guess if, if that if that's our only social exposure, I, I mean, I think this what we're alluding to here. Monkey is see, monkey do. The generations who are being raised on 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 the internet and social media as the as the main focus, uh, those those are the social skills that they're developing, and what what kind of uh, participants in a society are they going to become? And that's the scary part. Is this is the larger demographic that we're addressing? By the way, the the, the majority, people. correct. Well, yeah, the, the 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 boomers are aging out, so uh, yeah, they're giving them uh, again. Uh, this is a generation raised by an iPad. Yeah, it's really something. I, I'm not even a, I, I don't even own a smartphone, but I mean, if in this society, you got you a flip phone, John. I, I don't know. I just have a landline. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> nice. That's perfect. Well, you know, I, I figured that if people really want to speak with me, they could deal with voicemail. Right. Yeah. But, no, but I uh, I, I, what I'm saying is I'm a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a throwback in the sense that I recognize that the way society is going and the way the large company service providers are going is that this incredible expectation that everyone's going to have a, a smartphone in order to access, like, you know, you want to cross the border, you know, you do your declaration, use your smartphone. You know, you want to do this, you want to do that. You want to, you have to, you want to scan this barcode, you just, you know, use your smartphone. Uh, so there's 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 a trend towards that. It's, it's expecting that we're we're paying another service provider for some kind of item as a condition of a, participating in normal society. You know, it used to be the the automobile, and of course the automobile still has a major role. But social participation came with having a car. So sweet sixteen, you know, you meant you, you, you're driving a car. Right. You're a member of society now. Uh, and so the smartphone is, is, in a lot of ways, has become like that. And perhaps because the car, you know the car's utility is is important, but it doesn't do everything that a smartphone does. I'm so glad I didn't have a car when I was 16. By the way, oh, I would have gotten in so much trouble. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I would have done something bad for sure at, at age 16. Uh, so I'm glad that never uh, came to fruition in my life. But I knew many people that did uh, drive at that, at that age, and uh, I wasn't jealous. Uh, I knew at the time that. Uh, me behind the wheel, probably not the best idea at that time. Very interesting. I I, I was a young driver, but in, in later in my adult life, I I I, I don't drive. I have I, I I walk everywhere, but I live in a city, so yeah. I can indulge in that. I have transit. Um, not there's a lot of lot of city de or urban development was done around the car. You know, there's, there's municipalities in, in where I am where if you don't have a car, you really can't get go through those municipalities. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a rather challenging, I'm sure, uh, for sure. If you don't have a vehicle and you have to drive these long uh, distances, uh, but living in a city, perhaps, uh, maybe where you are in that area, I'm sure it's it's not too bad, right? Yeah, where I am is doable. Uh, I yeah. don't do a lot of long, longer trips, but I, I, you know, I can get my stuff done. It's just uh it's keeping me off the road <laughs> oh yes <laughs> well you know I, I wanted to just bounce back quickly uh, uh on this dalai lama business right, and, okay you know i just i just wanted to add basically that if uh if what happened between that child and the dalai lama was so enshrined and so sacred then i don't understand why the hundreds of thousands of people who are trying to get to nirvana in this lifetime why aren't they all french kissing with the dalai lama like, why isn't that happening? Why isn't there a crush of people demanding tongue action with the Dalai Lama if this is, you know, a sacred path? Uh, these people, these people that acquire a cold like following, they always end up doing this sort of thing, whether it's with a child or with someone's uh, wife of sorts. Well, and so, you know, there's a lot of denial and there's going to have to be a lot of breakthrough. In the, uh, in the Buddhist community, there's already people scholarly uh, educated people are talking about this problem uh, we just have to you know we have to disavow ourselves of the uh, the lost horizon mythos and you know get get real the Dalai Lama was on the CIA pay payroll in the 1950s I'm not exactly surprised but yes I, I had heard um, I'm not I couldn't verify it myself obviously but I, I 
can't really say for sure, but I always assumed and read things about that. Yeah, so it's 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 part of modern history. Uh, he was an in, he was a potential insurgent against the communist Chinese from the point of view of the American government, and so uh, he's been on the CIA payroll uh -huh. since at least that time. Another Fed, then, in other well, words. Well, yeah, and you know, honeypot uh, traps are part of the CIA playbook. Correct. So this is you know this is more Bill Cosby player type of honeypotting. Uh, Dalai Lama hasn't hasn't been accused of drugging anybody yet, but. I, I just say to you, it's Yet. this, this the, the, <laughs> the, the, the the behavior that I'm criticizing, the sleazy behavior that I'm criticizing, uh, is is not is not a stranger down at the uh, the three letter agency. Correct. Um, now I'm looking at this other clip here. I I don't think I could play it right away. I might have to go back into the email because it's not letting me uh, play it here. But mm. I'll get the clip right now, and this is of. Our friend, our other good friend, John Wayne Gacy, who, Gacy. who in my opinion, maybe might have been an asset to one of the Alphabet uh, corporations as well, as he had friends in very high places that were deep in, in the political world as as well. In the Democratic Party, yes. Correct. So you you don't know what was going uh, going on there. Some even suspect that he was almost like a hitman of sorts or carried out. Uh, some sort of blackmail on on people as well. Well, and so he, he may he may have been a representative, an agent of corrupt interests, you, you know, hidden in the society. You right. Know, he was he was the visible, uh, it, it, just like uh, here uh, the uh, the pig farm killings uh, in in British Columbia were the same thing. The RCMP were implicated. All the mayors of the municipalities were implicated. Uh, but he, he's the one who, who, who caught the sentence. So Okay, now I got the um, file here. All right, so so here we are in Anamosa State Penitentiary, 1969. John Wayne Gacy is, is incarcerated, and he's uh, participating in a rehabilitation uh, program in, inside the pen, and he appears as a speaker in a documentary uh, that's a showcase of the, of the rehab program. So he's talking about food prep. He's working in the kitchen as a cook. But I hear a, a, a long list of uh, uh, incriminating statements in his unconscious, and it led when, when I listened to this, it led me to believe that in 1969 he, he had already committed murder. He already had a victim, and this is an unreported victim that we're just discovering now. Uh, this is my perception based on this recording. I'll, I'll, I'll read ahead to the listeners. It's kind of long. The three messages in a row. The first message, he says, kill, put knife in kid. The second message, I hear him say, the victim's on the hill road beside the murder ranch. So he's like he's identifying the location of a body. Hmm. And third, I heard him say, uh, severs this hand, his knife, he cut your nose. My like goodness. A violent, violent interaction. Let's let's roll this clip from Animosa State Pen. He's talking cooking, but in the background, he appears to be cooking up some kind of a murder scheme. My God, kill, put knife in kid. Yes, let's roll that audio. We use eight gallons of oyster in that. Man, man. And we use the giblets and everything so it doesn't go away from the nice giblet gravy. We'll have candied sweet potatoes and use about 36 gallons of, of that. And so that they have a choice of potato, we make up 250 pounds of mashed potatoes mm -hmm. to go along with it. Murder, Murder kill So in pronouncing the first message, it was murder, kill, put knife and kid. Uh, murder, murder, kill, yes. Well, and so, uh, you know, I, I am pro uh, rehabilitation for, in prisons. I'm pro for these programs. People need to re-socialize. We don't want people going back after they're let out. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't come as a critic of that program to say the program was wrong in, in hosting uh, Mr. Gacy or not identifying these issues at that time. But they were con prisons will perform assessments on the prisoners. I'm saying in this case, we're, we're conducting an assessment on this prisoner 
and it just appears like he has all kinds of unconscious processes around around violent crime and perhaps right. perhaps he's describing the location of a, of, a, of a victim's body that was has not yet been uh, claimed as one of his killings let's play that one more time along with that we'll make up 10 baked pans large baking pans of oyster dressing we use eight gallons of oyster in that Man, my... And we use the giblets and everything so it doesn't go away from the nice giblet gravy. We'll have candied sweet potatoes and use about 36 gallons of, of that. And so that they have a choice of potato, we make up 250 pounds of mashed potatoes mm -hmm. to go along with it. I could definitely hear that. I could definitely make that out. Uh, the knife and the kid and uh, the road beside the murder ranch. I do make that out. Yeah, and, and it, you know, it, it characterizes this location as a, as, a, as a murder ranch, and it leads me to wonder about domestic black sites in the United States. Hmm. What I'm really leading to is I, I made the comparison earlier with the BC serial killer case, Robert Picton, the pig farm killer. Uh, is that these sites where these uh, crimes take place it somehow become sanctioned? Uh, you know, where, where you have mayors of municipalities at the at the Picton Ranch during one of these killing parties, or or the federal police attending, or federal police driving the victims up. And I'm saying here, like this notion that Gacy became some kind of an agent of corrupt uh, cor corrupt initiatives in in the prison establishment or the the justice establishment. Uh, it's it's sanctioned. It's as if, it's as if in our our society finds a way to sanctions what we what are normally construed as crimes. Right. I mean, we're still we're still operating uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, torture camp. Yeah, that hasn't I mean, stopped. I mean, that's insane. You talk about insane. These people have been there for almost twenty years. <laughs> what the fuck is going? Yeah, on? that is crazy. Un unbelievable. So I'm saying that this is sort of this. This is sort of a window into into a sort of a perversion in our society where we sanction what we otherwise condemn as crimes. You know, we 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 condemn them on Sunday and we go out and commit them on Monday. Absolutely, and then we go to church on Sunday. We're back on Sunday again. So <laughs> right. So I'm saying is the hypocrisy of of our establishment is not just it's not just the disturbing or disturbed individuals, but it's our it's our social it's our social and cultural structures themselves that are playing a role in fomenting uh, fomenting these outcomes. And in particular, we're giving we're giving free license to elements of society to commit crimes with no repercussions. Correct, and this is what I was mentioning in terms of people that are, you know, popular online, you know, that's bad behavior again is rewarded. There's people that uh, pay to drink, people to, uh, people pay to do all sorts of things online now, uh, streaming live, people donate to see you commit crime, and uh, people are dumb enough to do it. Yes, and so th this is, a, you know, indications of depravity and, and uh, missing components in our, in our popular education about, about values and the value of human life. That we we seem to have missed out. You know, we again we we we've come so far technologically. You know, we're, we're world we're world leaders in many fields, but in terms of character development, uh, you know, uh, we might as well be in the Stone Age with some of the situations that yeah. are, that we're that we're presenting. Uh, these uh, these personalities under, that are underdeveloped for different reasons. We you know when they're young. It's possible the educators can reach them. If the parents can't reach them, that the educators can reach them and, and inform their development onto a better path. And if, it, if it's not happening, then we inherit the adult the adult consequences of, of the, those upbringings. That's right. So this is you know this is my thinking in part is that uh, I, I'm speaking for the in a way I'm speaking for the young listeners, the people who have a chance to make different choices in their adult careers. They, by being informed about what's out there and the potential difficulties and dangers, they perhaps will be able to make better decisions than the folks who are unequipped 
with this kind of uh, knowledge or insight. So in part, that's what motivates me is that uh, younger people will be in, will be positioned to make better decisions and we will avoid repeating the mistakes of the past or or, or, or the mistakes that we seem to be co so socially ad as a society that we're addicted to recreating and recreating the same problems. I agree with you 100%. And of course, John Wayne Gacy also brought up uh, recently by yeah. uh, our friends over on that TV show, or it wasn't a TV show, it was a special of sorts, right? Quiet on the set. That was on, uh, yes, but that was on ID, I believe, on... Um, I'm forgetting what network that is, but yes, it's uh, go go look at that. You can find it anywhere, really. It's a documentary, basically on Nickelodeon and oh, just things that they were getting away with at the time. Right, and so the the the, the child actors are accusing the pe people in production behind the cameras of, uh, of of different abuses, and John Wayne Gacy was named by one a former child star in a story from NBC Chicago. He was named. Uh, as having a connection between one of the Nickelodeon producers. Yes. So this, so this goes back to your, um, you know, the the the, uh, the high mobility of of this uh, this perverted killer that he had incredible social and political mobility, and that uh, he was a figure. Uh, apparently, apparently, according to the actor, this this Nickelodeon producer was like a a diehard fan, a hardcore fan. Yeah, had letters and everything. You know, totally into it. So, um, we are. I, I guess what's my takeaway? We're vulnerable as a society. We're vulnerable to uh, malign influences, and uh, in some cases, that that's going to result in in, in deaths. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to be the church lady here, but I'm saying that, you know, with 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 better thought processes, we we could avoid some of the problems that we're getting into and some of the mass problems that we're getting into, but. We seem to want to uh, short circuit those kinds of uh, thoughtful processes, and and act on on um, the, the the urge of the hour. We act like people in some ways who have no self restraint. And I've said on the, my previous appearance that societies that can't exercise self restraint are uh, they uh, they're planting the seeds of their own self destruction. That's correct. And that was Brian Peck, by the way, uh, the Nickelodeon dialogue coach, mm -hmm. who was um, very much connected to uh, John Wayne Gacy. And, uh, yeah, this is parents out there. This is what your uh, kids were watching when they were growing up. Exactly. Uh, so we, 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 we can do a lot better. You know, we've, we've, we, we've made progress. We've, we've, we've done some amazing things, but clearly, clearly, clearly critics like me point out that w we could be doing so much better. Okay. And, uh, you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great uh, one day when I couldn't find any, nothing but good things to say about oh, positive things. Yeah. The major figures of society, all what, the most important people were, were awesome people. I mean, maybe oh, one day it, I'll say that. Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't <laughs> sell, though. <laughs> it's got to be awful uh, to make it roll. And uh, John, once again, I do want to thank you for being a part of the program. It's always a honor and pleasure to have you here, my friend. And I got to bring you back on. And we could just uh, talk about really anything here on the program. But I really do appreciate the clips that we that you brought in for us. That, that was a fantastic. This was a great time. I had a good time. I hope you enjoyed your time with us here on the program. It was great having a classic clip session with you again, and I hope that we'll do some more. You got it, my friend. I'll see you on the oh, way before I go or before you go. Uh, plug anything you'd like, my friend. Well, folks who are interested in connecting with me for consultation, private sessions, you can visit my website, yourinnervoice.com, yourinnervoice.com. You can also call my toll-free number to leave voicemail. Just get in touch with me, one 888 Four five three zero seven five one. That's one triple eight four five three zero seven five one. And there he goes, boys and girls. That was my guest, Mr. John Kelly. I do want to give a special thanks to all of you out there for pressing play. Those of you on YouTube, and of course, those on the podcast rendition of this program. Much love and respect to all of you around the world. I certainly hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. And of course, if you want bonus material, patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. Or if you want merchandise, that's always pretty damn cool. Go to michaeldeacon.com and click merchandise. You'll see it. Once again, stay safe no matter where you are on this island earth. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place and life itself is a mystery. Until next time. Good night.